Taxation is theft. Please, at least leave us alone in our living room. My job is to find the truth. Double the taxes. I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. Triple the taxes. This is an IRS agent's dream. If you think that the Capitol will ever treat us fairly, you are lying to yourself. Beautiful, lovely taxes. Uh -uh. Sorry, but I don't do taxes. Did you see the memo about this? The government is a greedy piglet. Just leave us alone. Do you know what Ralph just said? The roads. <laughs> you boys like Mexico! I'm as bad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! Hey, welcome back everybody. Taxation is theft. And um, so we have an interesting show tonight. Um, first, just a couple announcements. Uh, don't forget to head over to taxationistheft.cards and get your cool swag, t-shirts, stickers, hats, all kinds of other cool stuff. Um, and uh, uh, so something, um, we have kind of um, a similar show to, to what we had last week. Last week I interviewed Will Coley um, and it was about Islam, um, and he's, he's been Muslim for, I think he said about 15 years, and we had some really interesting conversations, and we learned a lot about that. Um, there were a couple people in the comments who kept pointing out, hey, but the Quran says this, kill all people who don't believe in Islam, and, and all these other things, and um, I just want to, I just want to point out an interesting thing, uh, because one of these people went on to have a conversation with me back and forth, um, for, um, pretty, pretty much, uh, up until, um, just now, um, since the show. And one thing he's been pushing is, Hey, you're, you're letting someone on the show who's saying he's, he's lying. He's saying he's trying to portray Islam in a way that it's, um, that it's not. And, you know, basically pushing the propaganda that, that all Muslims are dangerous and, and trying to get to, that's what Islam is. It's kill all the people who don't believe. And, he, he accused me of not wanting to know the truth because I told him it doesn't matter that he found this sentence somewhere um, because I told him I'm not judging any person that I talk to, specifically Will. I'm not judging him because he follows a religion that has a book that has one line of text somewhere that sounds threatening in the wrong context. I judge him based on his actions and his intentions. And, and through all the conversations that I've had with him, he's, he really believes in the non-aggression principle, um, not violating people's rights, very libertarian anarchist um, things. And in no way am, do I feel threatened by him at all. Um, so just because there's a sentence, you know, we have to understand, like, Christianity has those things. You know, nobody, most, I don't know a single Christian who lives Christianity to the, to the dot and T of every single sentence in, in the Bible. You have, you have, um, Catholicism has the, um, uh, confession. What's the confession for? Is it like, if, if everybody followed the book to the, to the sentence, there would be no need for that because everybody would be, everybody would be perfect, Right. Um, and so, so we have to we have to establish that there's cherry picking for good and there's cherry picking for bad. And some people use all kinds of religions for good or bad. And we have to judge individuals based on their actions, not based on some collective assumption of what something means, which may or may not have been out of context. So um, with that, um, I'm going to introduce Kareem El Sayed. How's it going, Kareem? Doing pretty good. Um, oh, oops, sorry. I'm uh, one <laughs> one man show. I forgot to unmute you. Um, uh, so welcome. Um, so we we actually just we we talked about a couple things um, uh, before we started the show. So. Why don't we pick up there? Because one of the specific things that that this this one gentleman kept bringing up was um, a sentence that says uh, that says kill all people who do not follow this religion. And you told me that there's actually a sentence that comes right after that that 
that actually kind of contradicts that or, or not contradicts it, but puts it into perspective of what it really means. So, yeah. Um, so first, you know, the, uh, so it goes like, you know, and uh, slay the disbelievers uh, wherever you may find them, right? So now keep in mind that the Quran cannot be translated literally from Arabic to English. The English version of the Quran is basically just the meaning of what is being said, not the exact translation, right? So you have to, you know, one has to understand what does disbelievers refer to? Because the Quran makes a distinction between the people of the book and disbelievers, right? The people of the book consists of uh, Jews, Christians, and I believe uh, Zoroastrians. Um, so disbelievers is not mutually exclusive to non-Muslims. Muslims, Muslims can, could also be disbelievers. The, di the way the Quran interprets disbelievers are those who cause corruption and mayhem on land, right? So it's not only saying that Jews and Christians could, uh, are capable of causing, you know, mayhem and corruption, but also Muslims can. So the term disbelievers covers all, um, you know, encompasses all the religion. It doesn't matter what religion you're from. It just matters that you're causing corruption, right? Or, you know, you're just causing trouble wherever you are. So, you know, with that being said, Muslims could also be disbelievers. And it says, so, you know, deal with them because it'll just cause you a bigger headache down the road, you know, down the line. So um, right after that one verse, it says, unless they transgress, uh, unless you transgress upon you first, right? So it's, um, you know, when you look at the entire surah, which is basically where that, you know, talks about warfare, it tells you to exhaust all means, you know, before resorting to jihad, you know, the lesser jihad. You have to, you know, exhaust all avenues, whether it's, you know, seeking, you know, um, peace through diplomacy and whatnot. Because at the end of the day, just focus on yourself and don't, you know, try to, you know, force your way of life onto somebody else. You know, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you know, to you is your religion and to me is my religion. I, you know, I respect your right to worship, you, for you to worship your own religion and, you know, vice versa. You respect my right to worship my religion. It's only an issue when you are trying to interfere with my personal life. That is when jihad can be invoked, when that life is threatened, um, you know, at the threat of death, basically. So unless um, there's absolutely nothing that can be done to remedy the situation, then you could invoke jihad because then your life is at risk, your family's life is at risk, your way of life is at risk. And that becomes that becomes more or less a self defense type exactly. thing, which you know we we have you know people all over the U.S. who find it who who find justification in murdering someone because they're not murder it's it's not called murder um, d depending on how you look at it. Some people will call it murder. Some people will call it self defense. If somebody breaks into your house, and you know usually you have the the, the family of the person who broke into the house who's crying over a dead body says, oh, they murdered him. And the, the person who killed him is like, well, he broke into my house and I didn't know what his, what his intentions were. Um, so we we see that in, you know, American law all the time. But for some reason and I, I think it's I think it's because people don't understand, you know, this this perspective that you're saying. They don't understand that it is in self-defense because. There's so much propaganda. I mean, you know, whenever we hear about these types of things in movies, it's it's terrorists and they're trying to they're trying to kill somebody or blow somebody up. So that's Hollywood propaganda. Um, and it's I, I think that's that's counterproductive to the fact that, you know, this is an entire religion of of what what is it? One point three billion people. Um, and that's, that's making an entire society believe something that's, that's not necessarily the truth or what it means. Um, but you, so, so you said something else earlier and I, I think that was a really, really important, um, uh, discussion because we hear the word jihad and 
and the first thing is like, it, you know, if you say that word to a lot of people who, who don't understand it, they're like, oh, my God, some, someone's going to blow themselves up or they're going to they're going to kill a lot of people. Um, but you were explaining that this this really means something completely different. You, you, can you explain that again? Yeah, absolutely. So the word jihad uh, translates to the struggle. Right. So there's two types of jihad that the Quran covers, um, the greater jihad and the lesser jihad. The greater jihad is overcoming, you know, your own personal vices to try to become a better person. You know, everyone is going through different struggles, whether it's someone that's battling, um, you know, drug addiction or, um, you know, alcoholism. You know, those are forms of jihad or someone that's battling depression or anxiety. Um, you know, that is what the greater jihad is. It's to overcome, you know, those problems, those issues within yourself to, you know, be the best person that you can possibly be. Right. So not only does it um, not refer to like war jihad, that is what the lesser jihad is. Lesser jihad is the right to defense. You know, um, if, like I mentioned earlier, if all avenues have been exhausted and there's, you know, no possible way that you can remedy the situation, then you can invoke on jihad, the lesser jihad. But you must, you know, there's a certain, there's a strict code of conduct that you must adhere to when you invoke, invoke jihad, right? You have to let the other person know, like, hey, you know, I'm going to arm myself, you know, and prepare for your, you know, in case that you try to come and attack me. You know, surprise attacks are a big no-no, right? You cannot, you know, you know, if I could put this in uh, layman's terms. You can't go up behind someone and sucker punch them. You have to let them know that you're going to defend yourself. Therefore, they you know, will be expecting you know, some form of retribution in case they try to do something, right? So unless your life is in danger or your way of life is in danger, you know, someone is threatening to annihilate you, annihilate your family, um, then you, know, you can invoke on the lesser jihad. And you have to follow a strict code, you know, in doing so. When it comes to war, right, the Quran explicitly outlines rules regarding warfare, right? So you need to give them ample notice that, hey, we're going to go to war because you're not respecting my, you know, right to live my life how I want to. So, you know, you let them know in advance multiple times in case they want, you know, if they want to change your mind, fantastic, right? But again, you cannot kill innocent people. You know, don't slaughter the disabled. Don't, you know, slaughter women. Don't slaughter children. Don't slaughter men that aren't fighting you. You know, don't burn down churches. Don't, you know, burn down places of worship. Don't burn down trees. Don't burn down farms, right? You know, don't kill those that are fleeing away from you, even if they're, you know, the opposing army, right? So, you know, there's a, it's a, there's a very strict code, you know, when it comes to warfare in Islam. And these sound like um, kind of the um, the the rules that might be in um, uh, you know like the I guess the it, <laughs> there's all kinds of places they come from but international rules of law where you know they say don't use chemical weapons don't blow up churches don't shoot um, uh, what is it um, journalists and, and then all this other stuff. So, so that's really interesting that that's in there. Um, but again, it's like, it, it's also, it's also interesting that it's, it's really self-defense. Um, and so what's, uh, well, let, let me ask you this, cause we haven't really, um, talked in that much in the past. What's your, um, political philosophy? Are you, are you, do you follow the libertarian philosophy at all or? So I was a libertarian for a brief while. Um, if I were to, you know, assign myself to a political affiliation, I'd probably align myself with the Republican Liberty Caucus. Okay. Um, you know, um, mainly because like the conservative ideology aligns with Islam more so than anything. You know, traditional family values, um, self accountability. Um, you know, like putting God first out of family and stuff like that. Okay. So, um, so I guess, um, what's, what's interesting to me is, is 
from a, a libertarian perspective, and I'm sure there's there's some overlay with the with I mean you know there's still Republican libertarian um, is still you know very libertarian when it comes to you know ind individual freedom, personal rights, and all these other things. Um, so what's interesting is like is uh, when I was talking to Will anyway, he, he was explaining that there's a lot of he examined a lot of different religions and he liked um, Islam the best because of its, um, I guess it's, it's correlation with, um, the non-aggression principle and, you know, treating others the way you want to be treated. Um, not, you know, not acting in offense, only acting in defense, these sort of things. Um, is that, I mean, is that, is that really typical within, within, I guess all the different, um, teachings of Islam or are there, are there, is that more or less the, the philosophy or how does that work? So, yeah, basically, you know, the entirety of Islam when it comes to the non-aggression principle is you do your own thing, you know, don't burden others with um, how you interpret the way you're supposed to live your life, right? Respect others like how you want to be respected, you know, basically the golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated. So what do you think, um, I mean, so if that's like kind of the core philosophy, how do you think we end up with, um, and I know it is a small group, but, you know, these people who who are extremists or is, I, I don't know, like it's it's even difficult to say that because the the reality is, you know, I don't <laughs> I don't trust the U.S. government further than I can throw them. And, you know, we're told. Um, you know, I'm living down in Mexico and they're, they're always spewing anti-Mexico propaganda. And like, I'm down here and I'm like, I don't see any of that. So when they start, you know, saying like, oh, this is, you know, oh, the Middle East is dangerous. There's, there's all these extremists and uh, that we should be afraid of is, I know for one thing that they're overblowing it, but how does that kind of, how does that happen if, if the core of the religion is, is, you know, mostly non-aggression principle self-defense? So, now, 99% of the issue is cherry-picking verses, right? Keep in mind that the people that are, more, that, that, that are most susceptible to these thwarted ideologies are those that are, <clears throat> you know, coming from places that isn't necessarily the ideal, you know, you know, they're not in an ideal state of mind to do so. I think there was a statistic that, you know, most of the foreign fighters you know, most of the fighters that were in ISIS were foreign, were foreigners, you know, from Europe, right? So a lot of these people had issues with, you know, the law. You know, they did drugs, they drank alcohol. So they're looking for something that is much bigger, basically something that conforms to their way of life, which is, you know, ISIS is a violent, you know, radical group. You know, hey, you know, they're, you know, they're basically giving me an excuse to continue living this way. So I'm going to go join them, right? Now, keep in mind that the people, like the natives who joined ISIS, like I'd say 95% of them were coerced into joining them because either join us or your, your family's going to get, your family's going to die. Right. You know, right. Um, so they were really left with no choice. And it's a, it's a terrible thing as well. So, you know, a lot of these, like, you know, most of the fighters that travel from Western countries to join ISIS never really lived by, you know, the, the laws of Islam. You know, they, like, I remember reading, you know, this one article that this guy who purchased a book called Islam for Dummies before he went over to you know, fight for ISIS, <laughs> you know? Like, it's like people that are, you know, knowledgeable about the Quran know that what ISIS is doing does not conform to the, you know, way of life that the Quran prescribes it. It's just, it, do, it doesn't, you know, mesh. You know, and you also look at radical preachers. They, you know, cherry pick verses. Like, oh, look, it says kill the disbelievers. So when you're coming from a place where, you know, it's not the healthiest state of mind, you just like latch onto that. You know, you look at the, like propaganda from ISIS. Like if you watch their videos, you know, you could almost see why people would fall into that because like, oh, look at the Western armies. They're, look how they're treating Muslims, you know? 
look at, you know, the U.S. drone bombing, you know, towns, killing innocent civilians. So, you know, that right. correlates right. well, because since these people are living in that society, they are, they should be held accountable to the actions of the government, thus making them targets, even though they're not actively engaging in those, you know, uh, wars. Right, yeah, right. That, I mean, that's, that's an issue we see with, with, I mean, like, so, so here's a, here's a big one. Um, when the United States dropped two atomic bombs on Japan, how many people did they kill? And how many of those people were actively engaged in warfare against the United States? They killed just, just tons of innocent people, like women and children who had nothing to do with this war. They had this this was supposedly in retaliation for for pearl harbor they didn't just they didn't go back i mean if if they really wanted to you know self defense fight back against what happened they would go against the air force base and that would be it or they would go against you know the capitol building and and you know whatever else the the and, and united states isn't the only one who does it but when you're when you're I mean, you're killing innocent people. Innocent people are going to get pissed off and they're going to want to retaliate. So I can understand how a lot of people um, in the Middle East, like, I mean, like anybody, anybody, if you're if you're a Christian, if you're atheist, whatever, picture yourself in America and bombs start falling on you and they say, they say from London or, you know, from from Wakanda or, you know, anywhere, Wh whatever it says on there, you're going to be angry and you're going to like, they just killed your innocent brother, mother, sister, who like has nothing to do with anything. You're going to be angry and you're going to want to, you're going to want to go do some damage to those people. Um, and, and, you know, especially like, you know, if, and this is, this is why we have to be careful with American foreign policy, because we're not sitting here, me and you and, and, you know, most of the people on our blocks are not sitting here saying, yeah, we should go drop bombs in the, in the Middle East or anywhere else. We're not saying that, but our neighbors are. There's our, you know, our Congress, our representatives, all these other people. They're attacking people and those people are going to get mad and they're going to they're gonna want to attack back the aggressors. And if we're sitting close enough to them and we're funding them with tax money, then, it, I mean, it's understandable. It's it's. <laughs> You know, if, if, if you get um, an example might be, you know, if you're just walking down the street and you get you get mugged by a group of three three guys, one of them's pointing a gun at you and saying, give me all your money. And there's two other guys. And well, they're not really robbing you. They're just standing there. But you don't know that you're going to defend your life. Right. You've got a gun pointed at you. You might in defense kill all three people. And well, I mean, it's it's it's. Um, were those two people assisting in the crime? No, but were they there? Yeah. So it's you know how how does that all play out? That all gets that all gets confusing, especially when you know people's lives are people are afraid. Um, you start mixing in all these variables and all this other stuff, and it's and it's crazy. But um, but yeah, I I don't know where I'm going with that. But it's you know we we I I think you know when it comes to the U.S. foreign policy they're not the good guys either. I, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of crazy people around the world. Um, but we can't just say it's one group. We can't say it's America because most Americans are not for aggressing other people. We can't say it's Islam because most, most Muslims are not for aggressing other people. Um, and so I, I think that's, you know, when people want to start using labels for things, that's, that's where we get into danger that's that's where we get into like racism and segregation and 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 you know grabbing an entire group of of japanese um and and putting them in internment camps and and all this other stuff that's that's really dangerous you know just for you know they didn't commit any crime it's just because they look a certain way or they they follow a certain book um i think that's really dangerous but um no you're you're absolutely right. You know, one of the um, driving forces behind the recruitment of ISIS is the alienation of 
you know, Muslims in Western, you know, society. You know, that label that you're talking about, collectively labeling group of people over the actions of a few, contributes to, you know, that state of mind. Like ISIS points out to it, if you like watch their propaganda videos, look at that. They're, you know, targeting you, you know? And it just gives them more of a reason to be like, well, they really are my enemies then, you know? And ISIS feeds off of that. It's a dangerous cycle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it is. It's a cycle. It's, it's, you know, this, this is how I view the whole Israeli-Palestine thing. Like, you know, that's always escalating and they're always, everyone's always retaliating. And it's like, okay, who threw the first stone? And that was so long ago that nobody knows anymore who threw the first stone or, you know, was, was the first stone, was the, the first stone, maybe it was too small that that one didn't count, but the one that came back in the opposite direction, that's counted as a, like, and it just keeps escalating. It's like at some point, if you want it to stop, somebody's got to say, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna stop retaliating." It's it's got to be that someone's got to say that. And you know, yeah, when one side stops, the other side might not trust you. Especially, you know, we've seen in so many places when there's a there's a little short period of peace that it doesn't always last that long. Um, because, you know, one side says, okay, fine, I'm going to stop. And then the other side doesn't trust it or takes advantage of the opportunity and, and keeps attacking. And when, when you stop, you have to stop and you have to just take whatever's going to keep coming until it stops. Because if you just say, oh, look, see, I stopped and then they didn't. So we're going to, we're going to start fighting again. You're not really that you didn't really stop. You were just, you know, trying to see if they would stop. Um, I, I think there's, I, I think I see a lot of conflicts that go that way. And, and, you know, when we have the ability to act defensively, um, which I, you know, we, we look at Israel and Palestine, I think Israel has the capability to act defensively, right? Like, you know, they, there's every once in a while they get some missiles coming at them. They've got, I'm sure they've got great defense systems to to just block a missile from coming i actually saw something that there was a demo that they had on a tank where they would shoot all kinds of rockets at it and the tank would basically use a computer system to detect anything coming its way and just blow it out of the sky before it got close enough to do any damage um if you've got this technology to act defensively just act defensively and say okay fine you can't hurt me now right and you don't have to keep attacking in the opposite direction but of course we know when with with um with Israel, it seems that's, you know, that's not really their agenda. They, they seem to want to just keep growing and, and doing their own thing. So that's, that's, um, that's unfortunate for what it is, but that's another, that's another thing. And of course there's that there's, there's so much propaganda on both sides of that. Um, especially in the U S that, you know, everyone's, everyone's out supporting without even knowing what's really going on over there. I think that's another, another, big one no yeah definitely for sure no i think the um whole israel palestine conflict um it has less to do with religion and more to do you know over territory right you know um especially with the expansion of the illegal settlements it kind of just gives you know the palestinians specifically hamas and hezbollah the uh the motivation to continue, you know, launching attacks, you know, they view it as a defensive measure because, you know, growing illegal settlements, right? But at the same time, um, you know, when we, you know, if you take a look at it, um, oh, you know, historically, the Israelis have, you know, offered multiple, you know, uh, peace offerings to the Palestinians and due to the arrogance of the Arab countries, you know, surrounding Palestine, they wanted it all or nothing, right? Now, you know, I'm like, I try to be as objective as I can, you know, when I look at the conflict between Israel and Palestine, you know, keep in mind that the uh, Zionist National Congress did legally purchase land from absentee Arab land landowners, right? Now, was it legal? Absolutely. Was it ethical? That's questionable because, you know, there were people living on these purchased lands, so they had no idea that these lands 
you know, they were, they've been living on for centuries has been sold to, you know, other groups of people. So when, you know, the Jews came to settle down, you know, one of the first conflicts that are, you know, that has risen was, hey, we bought this plan, we need, we need to tell you to, you know, bounce, basically. You know, right, right. They're living, they're like, the hell's going on, you know? Like, why, why am I suddenly being asked to, you know, leave? So, you know, that was like the seed to the whole, um, you know, territorial conflict. So, you know, going back to the peace uh, deals that the, you know, Jews offered the Palestinians, um, I, I think at one point they offered 90% of current day Israel just for the sake of, you know, living in peace. And the uh, Palestinians and the surrounding Arab countries rejected that, you know, which led to the uh, infamous, you know, six day war. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think both sides are equally to blame for the current status of the conflict. So, and, and this is interesting because there's um, part of what I see in that whole conflict is there's, there's the Israeli state, which is supposedly a Jewish state, which, which a lot of the really Orthodox Jews will say is not even really permitted by Jewish law. But you also have, okay, so let's say you have a guy in a house in Palestine, and and I've seen videos where you know you've got a Jewish family that comes in and basically just kicks him out. I've seen I've seen plenty of videos where they're just you know a plot of land with a couple little houses on it, and people are in there and they just get kicked out. Um, and this seems like a, a clear violation of property rights. Now, if what you're saying is true that that they purchased this land, then yeah, that's a different story. But at the same time. You know, what happens, uh, let's, let's just look at, um, you know, maybe, maybe um, a Western legal system where, you know, what happens if you buy land that has somebody on it, right? Um, there's, there's all sorts of squatter's rights and, and um, uh, adverse possession laws and, and all this other stuff where if somebody's been living on your property for, for 50 years and then you decide to sell the property because you claimed ownership in some government registry, then you suppose, you know, you have the right to sell that land, but you're selling it to somebody telling them, Hey, yeah, you can do whatever you want with this land, but there's people on it. And you, if, if those people have been on your land for long enough, you don't have the right to just go and kick them off. So if you sell the land to somebody else, that doesn't mean that that new person who just bought it somehow magically has that right to, to kick those people off either. Um, so I, I think that's, that's an interesting way to look at that whole um, situation. Yeah, um, no, it's very, uh, it's very murky. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, yeah. And that's, and that's the other thing, you know, like, like, like you said, it, I mean, this is how I see it. We have all of these countries and all of these and, and then countries form unions and all the way up to the UN who wants to make laws and, and tell, you know, every country in the world what to do. Um, but the reality is, like every city, like, you know, we, we should almost go back to a system where we had city states. And it's like, what sh what should it matter if you can walk? You could go. Anyone can go in and out of a city. What does it matter? The people in one city should not be able to dictate the laws of another city because that's how we end up with these massive, powerful governments that that end up trying to take over the world. It's like it's like, hey, cities, stay apart, leave each other alone and and do your own thing. And I think even, you know, even then, I, th I think that's that would solve a lot of problems. But but yeah, there's I don't know, people trying to take other people's land is always. Why do you need why do you need to take over 500 million acres of of land and, and claim that your laws apply to anybody who's in that geography? Like what what sense does that make other than like I can only imagine that the people who want to do stuff like that are just complete egomaniacs or, you know, there's oil and they want that or, you know, other kinds of resources. But um, yeah, that's just 
I don't know. It's, it's, I think if people would think more along the lines of non-interventionism, non, non-aggression, I think that would most likely, you know, get people thinking more amicably, okay, let's, let's put the past behind us and see, see what peace we can make here and just go about living our lives instead of trying to dominate each other with, <laughs> with laws and all kinds of other stuff. Um, anyway, we're, we're, <laughs> we're way off topic, but, um, uh, but good stuff. So, um, I'm just reading some of the comments. Um, I, I just saw, I came across a comment where someone mentioned Takia, which for some reason is a trigger word for those that have some sort of animosity towards Islam. Right. Okay. Um, so like, you know, honestly, man, I hadn't, I didn't even know what that word Takia was until some, you know, guy brought it up and accused me of it. <laughs> it's a, you know, the key is not even, you know, a Sunni concept. It's a Shia concept, right? But okay. it's not what people make it out to be saying that, you know, they're allowed to lie to advance their cause. No, the key is a purely uh, self-defense mechanism. If someone comes up, you know, for, let me give you an example. You know, let's just say, you know, I'm walking down, you know, I'm in my house, right? And someone comes and breaks in and he's like, hey, I'm going to kill you. Are you Muslim? Right? I'm going to, like, the, the common sense route would be, uh, no, I'm not Muslim. Right? That's the key. You're allowed to lie, you know, regarding your religion when your life is in danger. You know, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam specifically said, don't, you know, die over a stupid cause like that. <laughs> You know, wow. like don't you're not gonna you know don't don't attempt to be a martyr. You can lie so as long as in your heart you're Muslim. What comes out of your tongue is not, you know, is not sin, because as long as you believe you know in Islam in your heart, then you can say whatever you want to preserve your life. That is the key. You know, I'm not gonna say yes, I am Muslim, and next thing I know, I get a bullet to the head. Yeah. You know, that is what Takia is. You know, yeah. allowing you to. You know, lie about your religion so you don't end up dying for it. And and that's something I'm sure a lot of my viewers would identify with when when the cops ask if you have any drugs on you, <laughs> and and you say uh, no, even though you know you do. It's okay to lie to the police to protect your right if you have a right. Um, you know, and not not even drugs. Um, anything that's it, it might be like, you know, they might ask, do you have any weapons on you? Maybe you keep a, we a weapon for self-defense. You say no just because, you know, if you say yes, the cop's going to freak out um, and, you know, escalate things as they as they normally do. That's like, that's, that's a really interesting one. And, of course, um, the government hates being lied to, so they, they make all these laws where if you lie to the government, then you're in even more trouble. But... But I think that's a really interesting um, that's a really interesting position, whether you know whether whether it comes from religion or law to be able to to lie. I mean, think about it. If you can kill somebody in self-defense, isn't lying kind of a less a less um, aggressive? defense mechanism like nobody you're not harming another person with that lie in defending yourself whereas if you killed somebody in defense you kind of are um I, I think that's a really interesting position but yeah so so but more to your point um i guess that's you know that's really interesting because that's that's not even really what that's addressing in or sorry i guess the accusation that it allows you to lie, which I, I haven't heard that one. Um, but of course it's, it's, that seems common sense. Like, you know, like, Oh, um, what, what is it? Uh, uh, well, I guess just, you know, whenever you travel through, through immigration and they say, well, do you have any, anything on you like uh, cigars or alcohol or any of this stuff? Like it's natural just to say no, because, what if you say yes they're going to start searching your bags whatever you save yourself a little bit of hassle um but uh but yeah that's but that's interesting to say that that 
that yeah that accusation it's it's presumptive it's it's i mean imagine that like you ask sorry I, i'm i'm kind of processing this in my head so so i'm not sure what to say but if um you know the police stop somebody and they say you know hey are you on your way to do anything illegal and the person obviously says no i'm not on my who would say yes to that they say no and then the cop says, well, I know that you're, you know, whatever. I, I know that there's this street gang out there. And if you were part of that gang and you're on your way to do something illegal, that gang will allow you to lie and say you're not to a police officer. Uh, like, so I'm going to, I'm going to use that knowledge that I know about this gang to assume that you are lying to me and you are part of that gang. It makes absolutely no sense to make that accusation. But is that is that kind of what when you, when you said somebody accused you of that is that kind of like what where where they were going with that? Um, yeah, <laughs> did you follow much. that at all? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just because like when someone accuses you of Takia, at that point, there's no point in arguing with them because they're just going to assume that you're going to be lying that you're regardless lying. of what you say. Right. You know, so it's a catch twenty two situation. You know. You know, at one, you know, in one hand, you know, they're wondering why, you know, there aren't any Muslims coming out speaking out against terrorism. On the other hand, they believe that every Muslim, you know, pre engages in taqiyya. So it's like you can't win. <laughs> so, yeah. So if you did it, they would say, oh, he's just saying that. Exactly. Unless I, you know, uh, you know, unless I, you know, agree with what you're saying. Like, yes, I am lying to you. Like, see, he's telling the truth. <laughs> you know? man um yeah that's that oh so i was actually thinking about this one the other day um if you accuse anybody of like you know you 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 accuse anybody of being an alcoholic no i'm not well it's okay you're in denial and the first step is admitting that you have a problem but i'm not in denial i'm not an alcoholic well it, i know we'll we'll don't worry we'll get through this together and like it's it's that accusation of it's it's really that uh, and man if, if you think that's crazy just just go try that on somebody and keep insisting they're in denial <laughs> they'll, they'll lose their minds um man yeah that's 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 pretty crazy and you have to be like what state of mind do you have to be in to to believe something like that because it's like it's like, do you just not trust the world? Like, are you that brainwashed or what's going on there? That's a scary thought. You know, I blame websites like Jihad Watch or Islam Unveiled or Islam Exposed, you know, and it, it, it just feeds into their perception that all Muslims are liars, regardless of what they say. So, you know, how, how do you, like, circumvent that? You really can't. You just, you know... You just ignore them. You know, there's a there's a famous Arab adage that goes um, that that goes as follows. You know, the best way to silence a barking dog is to just ignore it. Yeah. That's... You know, because the more attention you give to them, the louder you're gonna get, and you're just gonna drag you down to their level, and they're gonna beat you with stupidity. So. <laughs> I'm just worried about when they get together in a group and they just kind of they just kind of resonate with each other and kind of grow into their, into their little cluster. But I mean, that happens with, with everything. I mean, you've got, you've got, you know, hate groups like the KKK who are, who consider themselves to be Christians. And it's like, most Christians would look at that and say like, that's not us. And, but it's like, it's like, you know, if you were to, if you were to ask the same things of, of any Christian that, that, you know, that they ask of a Muslim, like, so, so you're Christian, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm a Christian. So do you condemn the KKK? What? <laughs> like, where did that come from? <laughs> like, you know, it's, or do you, do you condemn the, the, the pedophile priests? Like, I mean, well, that one seems like that would be more, uh, I think, <laughs> I think more Christians would, but I think the KKK one is kind of like, like, where did that, because most people don't even associate um, the KKK with Christianity because it's it's 
so um why it's like it's because it, it's so disconnected but at the same time it's like you know it's connected but i i think arguably you know the same thing when you talk about extremists and, and terrorists and that it's they're not um they're not acting out of the religious part of islam they happen to be muslim but that's not really what they're doing i I don't think it's i don't think that's the case because you know we see there's there was an interesting um uh guy that i saw talk and and you know he pointed out that even there's even groups of like uh what is it hindus and and um uh what's it called buddhists that are extremely violent violent um in asia that are you know they're doing the same thing they're going around killing groups of people we don't hear much about it but these are these are considered extremely peaceful religions even by you know most americans because there hasn't been any propaganda against them but there are people claiming to be those religions who are going around just slaughtering people and there's that connection isn't made and i think i think propaganda has most is is mostly the reason why because they're i mean that has to like that's that's kind of a control experiment right you've got all these religions all of them have hateful groups and only this one for some reason is everybody in that religion is presumed by by some not by all is presumed to be in in the extremist group that has to be propaganda because why why else wouldn't every other group be be seen that way you know exactly you're right and you know honestly i don't like these like the leaders of these you know extremist groups use religion as a front for a much you know deeper motive right it's just because religion is you know um you know, especially in Islam, it's not just a religion, it's a way of life. So to those who aren't necessarily well-versed, you know, in Islam, they're like, you know, they, they fall into that trap of, oh, you know, well, you know, this guy is saying that we should be doing this because it conforms with, you know, this interpretation of this specific text, you know, therefore I will be supporting them when the leaders um, know that you know what they're they're not trying to advance any religious cause it's just for their own personal gain i mean if you look at saudi arabia a lot of the uh, state-sponsored sheikhs you know um consistently spew out you know um state-friendly rhetoric that uh paints the uh, saudi regime in a positive light and they are actually you know they've been imprisoning she uh uh, sheikhs and imams that um, criticize the Saudi regime. Interesting. You know, so it's not, you know, like, I personally don't believe that religion is a driving force behind these groups. Rather, they're just using it as a vehicle to accomplish you know, ulterior motives. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. I mean, so a lot of people will argue that the U.S. is a Christian nation. And so, okay, so this is, let's draw the parallels, right? So Saudi Arabia is, let's say, a Muslim nation, and the United States is, let's say, a Christian nation. Um, Saudi Arabia doesn't treat its women well, and that's because it's Muslim. The United States treats its women well, and that's because it's Christian. But we didn't always treat our women well. Like they just, they just got the right to vote like a few years ago. Um, blacks just got the right to vote a few years ago. Um, blacks just got the right not to be slaves a few years ago. Um, so when we had slavery and when we had segregation and we had you know women who couldn't vote and and women who were largely treated as as objects by most of society like you're a housewife you stay put like like an animal was that was was it still a christian nation back then and was that because of christianity and and so you look at all the um all the things in in saudi arabia and say well is that are, are you blaming that on on the religion 
Or is that something that can change and the religion might still stay the same? Because is every Muslim country like that? And there are plenty that aren't. Exactly. It's only, you know, in Saudi Arabia, like in Egypt, women are not required to wear the hijab, right? Even in, you know, the Quran, it's not mandatory. You know, it's entirely left up to the woman's decision whether or not she wants to wear the hijab. A lot of the issues that stem with the women in the Middle East comes from cultural practices that predate Islam, right? I mean, even one of the princes in Saudi Arabia said that a lot of the laws that they have in place are cultural and not religious, you know? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Like, in so even in U.S. law, right, somebody gets charged with a crime and they go to court, even, even though this is a Christian nation— Nobody pulls out a Bible and says, well, it says here in the Bible you can't do this and this is the punishment. No, they pull out the penal code and they look at the statutes that man wrote, men who worked for the government wrote and said, this is the law as we're going to have it in this nation. And I would imagine Saudi Arabia is the same if they're, if they're prosecuting people, if they're allowing something. They're not using the Quran in their courtrooms to to prosecute crimes. I mean, I, I'll be honest. I don't know. I don't know much about that part of the world to even know whether or not they have like legit trials like that or not. Um, but I, I think that would be knowing how governments work. I can't picture that happening. Like, Oh yeah, we're going to have a trial and we're going to use um, a religious text for the prosecution of a crime when there's already a government who, that has its own set of laws. They're going to use the government's laws to prosecute. Mm -hmm. And it might not be, and those laws are not going to be the same, just same way as, you know, America as a Christian nation does not have the same laws as what's in the Bible. It has its own set of laws. So that's, that's an interesting. I also, um, so I want to address one misconception about Sharia, right? Um, so you know when you, when you know you hear about Sharia, you think it's like this, you know, set of laws that Muslims are trying to replace the U.S. Constitution with, which is absolutely asinine and ridiculous, um, let alone you know impractical. <laughs> but um, you know, Sharia is not mutually judicial, right? Sharia means the path. And Sharia encompasses uh, almost every facet of Islamic life. You know, to how, you know how to pray properly. You know, dietary restrictions. You know, you can't eat pork, you can't drink alcohol. To how to conduct yourself in public. You know, Sharia is not just you know laws that are set in stone. I mean, there's multiple schools of thought when it comes to Sharia. You know, there's not just one Sharia that encompasses the entire Middle East. No, you have, you know. The four major schools of thought in Sunni uh, in Sunni Islam, which is Hanifi, Hanbali, uh, Maliki, and Shafia, right? Each with their own different interpretations of, you know, Quranic law, you know, Sharia. So, um, and those are Sunni ones. Then you have the Shia ones. I'm not too clear of them. I think one of them is Al Zayyida, and another one. Um, and there's another one. I forgot what it was called, right? But, you know, you keep in mind that these laws, like these schools of thought are constantly changing. You know, it's not just like something that is, you know, set in stone. They're constantly being, you know, updated regarding certain, you know, legal issues within the frameworks of Islam, you know? Um, so it's just like... It's just like U.S. jurisprudence where, you know, the courts will decide, well, that this law and this law don't make sense together. So we're going to have to figure out, you know, or or the law has not considered this particular situation between these two people. Let's let's figure out what what the best resolution is for this problem. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, that's really interesting. And like, you know, a lot of people don't realize that. Even in the U.S., a lot of our laws are based on, like, they're based on legal systems that go back, like, centuries, like, into Roman times, in, into, like, the, the beginning of philosophy, where people were, like, you know, where do rights come from? Where, like, 
what is freedom? What is life? What is the purpose of government? All these other things. Like, these things are, are you know, I don't want to say too frequently, but they're frequently referenced in, in you know, court cases where, you know, there's not a prescribed law that says what should be the outcome when a certain thing happens. And it's more of like, okay, well, what's the best rational way to to settle this? And they look at like, well, hey, these um, these shepherds 5,000 years ago, they used to do this. And, and when they had this sort of dispute, this is how they would handle it. And then they'll say, well, so that's very similar to this dispute that we're discussing today. And so, you know, this is how we should resolve it. And this happens all the time. And sometimes if this, if this happens in like a high enough court, like the Supreme Court, that kind of becomes the law until, of course, you know, somebody, somebody prescribes something else in, in another statute. But so, so it's not necessarily a bad thing because like, I, I know there's like, I hear this all the time. People are like, oh my God, they want Sharia law to take over and it's going to, we're going to turn into a Muslim country and everything's going to go to hell. And it's like, what is that? What does that really mean? Um, is, you know, I, I, and you know, they're usually paranoid about like, yeah, we're going to be stoning people who, you know, adulterers and, and I think that's a Christian one. I don't know. Um, but it's, it's, yeah, everyone has this kind of weird thought in their head and they don't really even understand the legal system that we have now and where that came from. So I think that's a, that's, that's another interesting point. And I, I think that's also still like, that's, that's still propaganda and hysteria that kind of leads to that. That's, man, we're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a ridiculous, irrational fear. Um, and even, like, I'm going to entertain that thought for a second, because it's so ridiculous that it's fun to think about. That's how stupid it is. It's really funny, right? So, okay, how are we going to go about, you know, instituting Sharia law, you know, in a country that has, like, what, 300 million people? Like, how, like, w you know, what ways are we going to accomplish that? Because, obviously, you know, you're not just going to, throw the Constitution out and have the full support of Congress, you know, and the three branches of government to do so. It's just not practical. It's right. so it, it's so stupid to think about. Like, I, I you know, I'm amazed uh, at, you know, the mental gymnastics that, you know, the, these people who have this irrational fear of Sharia uh, taking over that constantly just plays out in their head. And it's, it's just really funny to think about. Yeah, like, I mean... How, the 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 liberals banning all guns is more likely to happen and that's they i mean they they keep getting a little bit closer with that one but it's it's not going to they're not going to overturn the the second amendment or repeal the second amendment um but there's a a huge amount of people who want to but it's never going to happen um and you know if you compare that it's like it's like yeah if if you know it's not like we're not going to become Saudi Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's ridiculous. And I was talking to someone, you know, I, I, you know, I asked him to explain his thought process about how, you know, Sharia could be instituted in the United States. Like, oh, well, you know, you vote people in that are sympathetic to Sharia and you, you know, and, and it is brought, you know, takes off from there. I was like, well, I'm really flattered that you think that 2% of Muslims living in the United States have the capabilities and are even organized to begin with to attempt a ridiculous feat like that. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. It, it's just, it, it's, it's so, it, you know, it's no different than those who think, you know, there's a secret group of Jews who are conspiring to take over the world. You know? It's stupid to think about. It, it's a dangerous mentality, but, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, it is pretty crazy. Anyway, all right, I think we're, we're at our time for tonight, but um, it's been really great talking with you. I think we, we talked about some really interesting points um, and, uh, and had a really great conversation. Um, is there, um, is, do you have like any websites um, you want to promote? Just, I mean, it can be, it doesn't even have to be related to what we're talking about. Um, uh, or if, there's, if, if anybody's interested in learning more about um, Islam even. Where's a good place for them to look? I don't know. Any anything you want to plug? So you know, actually, I had a page that I um, started a while back. 
called the, um, excuse me, um, one second. While he's looking for that, I'm going to, I'm going to drop a couple plugs. Go to taxationistheft.cards and get your, your swag, your rubber stamps, so you can stamp all your bills to say taxation is theft. T-shirts, hats, stickers, all kinds of cool stuff. And of course, so yeah, I have a page called the um, the Muslim American Conservative. Okay. Right, that I started uh, two years ago. So you know, if you're like interested in trying, you know, you know, uh, hearing about like the perspective of a Muslim American conservative, I I suggest that you follow it. Awesome. And I'm I'm definitely going to check that out. And it's is it the American? No. No, I got somewhere else. Uh, the uh, Muslim American Conservative. The the Muslim American Conservative dot com, or is it? Uh, it's a Facebook page. Ah, okay, cool. I'll look for it. Okay, cool. Um, all right, man. Well, it's been great talking with you. And uh, taxation is theft. Amen. Thanks for having me, Dan. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Anytime. All right. So then. Taxation is theft. Please, at least leave us alone in our living room. My job is to find the truth. Double the taxes. I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. Triple the taxes. This is an IRS agent's dream. If you think that the Capitol will ever treat us fairly, you are lying to yourself. Beautiful, lovely taxes. Uh -uh. Sorry, but I don't do taxes. Did you see the memo about this? The government is a greedy piglet. Just leave us alone. Do you know what Ralph just said? The roads. <laughs> you boys like me.